time once again for Community Forum, and we are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Melody Simley and Julie Tackett. Melody Simley and Julie Tackett are both with Washington Citizens for a DOC Ombudsman, DOC being Department of Corrections, or the uh, prison system here in the state and they're in this morning to talk to us about conditions in Washington State prisons and impacts on prisoner families. Melody and Julie thank you both for coming in and spending time with us this morning. Thank you. You're welcome. So let's start out if you would tell us uh, a little bit more about the Washington Citizens for a DOC Ombudsman and how you both got involved in this issue. Okay um, so we started this group on Facebook. We actually um, were networking with a lot of families that were having problems um, navigating the system at the Department of Corrections. And um, we're actually interested in establish establishing an ombuds program in the state of Washington for the Department of Corrections through the governor's office, so it's independent of um, the DOC. And what we do is we work with families and other um, agencies to get them involved in lobbying with the legislators to, um, you know, make phone calls, have meetings with them, and just kind of discuss what's going on with their interaction with the Department of Corrections and the need for an ombudsman. Mm -hmm. In fact, Melody and I met at a hearing for one of the earlier uh, ombuds uh, pieces of legislation, and Melody did mention that a lot of what drives families to looking for a solution uh, in their relationship with the Department of Corrections was just navigating the system. Who do you call? What's this about? And uh, there's not a lot of internal assistance for a family member who's just looking for help um, in a general capacity. For myself, um, I knew exactly how to navigate the system. I read the policies. I would go to my legislator. But what happens uh, to many families when you do advocate for your loved one in prison is you get a lot of pushback and retaliation. And so things like losing your visits, unfair accusations, a lot of families were frustrated. And I actually went to the hearing because I was beside myself, my family member, does self-harm, he's mentally ill, and in the psychiatric residential treatment program in the prison system. So he's pretty mentally ill, and he was doing some pretty serious self-harm, and no one would help me. And the facility would not address my very legitimate concerns. And so I went to Olympia, and that's when my trouble started at the facility. So for many of the families, we really need an ombuds because it puts a blanket of protection over us. So when we go to them and say, this is going on, we're advocating and we're getting pushback. It's obvious that stuff is not appropriate and not per policy and having an ombuds would really put that layer of protection on families as and they even try the, to advocate. Yeah, mm -hmm. and even the folks that go to their legislators looking for help, um, we find that a lot of legislators don't really know a lot about the Department of Corrections and they haven't been very helpful. They want to help but I just don't think they're familiar with the system and mm -hmm. how it works and, and basically how to push back for their constituents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they're willing, but yeah. there's a great learning curve. It's a complicated bureaucracy with a lot of uh, insular attitudes. And so it really takes somebody that's really willing to learn the system, understand the system, and then work with the system. Um, and slowly, it's a, it's a learning process. We have certain legislators that do a great job for their constituents, but you know, it's catch as catch can. Yeah. So. The Ombuds Bill mm -hmm. actually came about in 2007. Um, Senator Castama ran the bill, and I believe maybe another year. And then during the recession, there was absolutely no money, so it kind of laid in wait for a while. Um, and then in 2013, Senator Carroll ran the bill. And uh, 2014, Senator Darnell did. And this last year, Senator McAuliffe ran the bill. And uh, Representative Moscoso ran a companion bill in the House for, I believe, the first time. So mm -hmm. um, it's an idea that's definitely gaining momentum. And we find that more and more every year, the more we network and the more people we talk to, it's, it's uh, getting bigger. And, you know, we had great bipartisan support. Um, I'm in the 39th out in Monroe. And... Uh, Senator Kirk Pearson has done an excellent job for families uh, and the prisoners and the correctional officers. Yeah. He's really cares about the whole system, and I know Oban. And we had great Republican and Democratic support in the Senate um, and the House. So it's an issue. People want to get smart on crime. 
not right on crime yeah. and right on crime. So um, I always like to kind of chat a little bit because prison is such a big piece to chew off. And, and if unless you have somebody on the inside, it's really kind of hard to get your head around it. And I like to start by saying, you know, I'm a United a citizen and when I started to go to prison and sit in that visiting room, I kind of looked around like, you got to be kidding me, yeah. <laughs> you know, that this is really going on in my name with my tax dollars. And um, families then become astute citizens who have a front row seat to what's going on. And so I just try to bring the family experience or a citizen's experience to the big table, whether that's the DOC Family Council or this interview or the legislature because people are curious and they want to know so what I had to get my head around is that prison you know kind of is is us we have laws to disallow certain behaviors that is not that are not acceptable in a civilized society so they pass a law you break it your consequences many times you go to prison so according to the RCW the revised code Washington going uh, your punishment should generally be limited to the denial of liberty. So to say that another way, going to prison is your punishment. You don't go to prison to be punished further. And I Which think is exactly <laughs> what happened. It's yeah. a laundry list mm -hmm. of punishment. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And you have to ask yourself how much punishment is enough. Where do you draw the line between punishing and actually rehabilitating people who are going to come back in, mm -hmm. into our society? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, I understand that some, what it intrigued you first was the conversation about the prison food and, and how the families are feeling compelled to uh, supplement and having seen what's really going on and, and knowing what, what they're eating or not eating. Suddenly with this awareness, you have this you know, inherent sense of right and wrong that says, well, would you allow someone you love to live in this condition? And there have been some some things that we've observed and some possible solutions and we'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, the way things go as far as food in prison so Melody, you might want to talk go. a little bit about can I get you both to pull your microphones a little oh. bit closer just, <laughs> little I know closer. I was the one that set those up but oh, okay <laughs> we'll get better sound mm -hmm. okay so um, so the food so for many 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 years um, the prisoners used to grow vegetables. There was a dairy farm. There was um, a lot of, of work that went into how they ate. The prisoners cooked the food. Um, they ran the kitchens, overseen obviously by correctional officers. Um, and then Correctional Industries of Washington, which I, I can't even begin to explain. I'll let Julie do that somewhere down the road. Um, took over the food. And what happened, um, they did it as a way for um, to save costs, um, and the food that they produce is very starch, carb, cheap um, oriented, and the portions got really small as well. And so what happened, for the longest time, we weren't allowed to buy food and send it in, but they um, developed a program with one a subsidiary called Union and Access, where we could buy things through them that were sent to the prison. Um, it was kind of be careful what you wish for. We ended up getting the quarterly packages so we could supplement their food. But it, um, I noticed looking through the catalog, and I, I shared with you that um, a lot of the food is dollar store junk um, it, at, at pretty high prices. Julie and I actually took a field trip into the dollar store, which is like a mile from my house, and then walked over to Safeway as well and kind of went through and realized how what poor quality the food is for the prices that we're paying and basically families are starting to feel like cash cows. I mean everything that we do costs money and there's fees associated with it. We put money on our phones. There's an If you use your debit card there's an $8 fee. You can mail in a money order where there's no fee but if you want immediate access and you use your credit card or a debit card it's $8. Mm -hmm. um, the, the list is kind of lengthy. The they have a JPay system, which is their email system. So basically, it's overseeing what's coming and going on it. Um, but that costs money to buy the stamps. Um, so basically, it's just mail, a, an electronic mail system. Um, and then the property. So if I want, um, is it 
Bill Bowerman that had uh, started Nike? I'm not sure. I can't remember. I so. yeah. Well, in oh, the yeah. movie that I saw, he, he made tennis shoes. He started out making them on a waffle iron. And that's pretty much what the prison shoes look like. So if you can't afford to buy your own shoes, I'm sure they're not very good for your feet. And they're, they're very strange looking. They look like they came straight off a waffle iron. So you buy shoes. You buy, you know, the units were so hot you could buy a fan. So, I mean, the money just continues to add up and up. And if your loved one is across the state, you're paying for gas. You're paying for a hotel. Um, I'd like to pop in Commissary, (laughs) and I'll let Julie explain the commissary. That's complicated. So you have to envision when somebody goes to prison, they get nothing. They get the clothes on their back. They don't get a hot pot. They don't get a fan. They don't give them a toothbrush. They don't fry them. They get like a little fish kit, like a little hotel kit when they get there. So inmates and or their families buy everything. Nothing is free. And if you're indigent, so there is a concept that if you are an indigent, prisoner that um, you can have up to ten dollars on your books and they consider you poor and they will let you charge on the company store your razor and your toothbrush and your comb but that is not something they give you they then charge it and put it onto what they call institutional debt okay so I'd like to describe a dollar coming in so I'm gonna send i Todd is at Monroe, and and, uh, he's indigent. And so the first $10 are not subject to any of these deductions. So let's say I send Todd 10, he gets 10. Let's say I'm gonna send Todd $100. Now, it goes through every dollar coming in from a family member goes through a series of deductions before it even hits their account. So the first thing that happens, 5% is taken out for the Crime Victims Fund to fund organizations. 10% is taken out and put into a non-interest bearing checking account for the inmate upon release, well and good. 20% is taken out for cost of incarceration. Now I was like, okay, room and board and whatever. And then I realized in reading the paperwork that that 20% actually goes straight to correctional industries. And once it gets involved in their world, it will never be returned nor any profits that they generate to the general fund, to the DOC, to the state of Washington. Okay, so that's 35% out of every dollar that anybody sends in. Okay, now if you've got any legal fines and obligations, like say he had a Western District Court, he had a $260 something or other, that's another 20%. Institutional debt, that's another 15%. So when I first met Todd, his deduction rate was 95%. So I'd send in $100 and he'd get five. Well, actually, yeah. he'd get 10 because there was a limit, right? So I brought that down to 55% by paying off some of his institutional debt and some of his legal fines. So now you're talking about a family member, myself, wanting to buy food for him, and my dollar is not even worth a dollar. At one time, my dollar was worth a nickel. Now my dollar is worth 45 cents. And every, like I said, every inmate, except the lifers, has at least a 35% deduction rate. And that goes on the wages they earn as well. So, you know. And, and yeah. more than that, they, the store, the commissary, used to be once a week. Mm-hmm. So you could send in $10 a week. They could buy razors, coffee, you know, personal hygiene items, um, over-the-counter medicines. Well, when CI took over the store, they limited it to almost, what, maybe twice a month? So now, as far as being able to spend money, you're Mm -hmm. only allowed to spend $10 Mm -hmm. twice a month Mm -hmm. now to buy all of those things. Otherwise, you have to send in more, and then you get stuck in that deduction process. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how this came about, but basically all of these things are placed on the backs of families. Mm-hmm. And we're paying the crime victims. We're paying, you know, so all of this money that's being deducted mm-hmm. are, are from families. Interestingly enough, I got some very nice records from the public disclosure unit at DOC asking, you know, how much money do inmates make in a year in total and how much money do families send in? And for 2011, 12, and 13, families sent in about $6 million a year. So 10% of that is going into an interest 
non-interest bearing, at least for us, you know, savings account. So somebody's making interest off six hundred, you know, that that, and twenty percent goes to correctional industries. So that means a million dollars a year comes out of the families of pockets and goes straight into CI. And that's before we turn around and buy all of the rest of the stuff from them as well. That have the profit. Prices, yeah, that yeah. have profit margins. So I'm really big on follow the money and. Um, what I've seen is actually interesting because we were at the family council meeting and not a lot of people knew that that 20% that they called cost of incarceration went to correctional industries and the head Lyle Morris was there and I just sort of tossed it out there I said so is it correct that the 20% cost of incarceration goes to CI and the look on his face was like how did you know that <laughs> and then the financial guy from Olympia looked to the woman next to her and said is that true? And I go, you're, that, you're in finance and Olympia and you don't even know where this money's going. And I think that's when, um, I think that's when they kind of knew that families were going to be very proactive and being very responsible citizens and just calling a, a spade a spade and saying, we can see what's happening. We're going to look you in the eye and say, we know, we know you know. <laughs> and now you know, you know that kind of how that goes. But, and you know, to be honest with you, a lot of times when you get high enough in Olympia and you bring something to their attention, they'll go like, we do that? You know, yeah. so a lot of it is awareness. You don't have to get ugly. You don't have to be unreasonable and stomp your feet. And that's why we encourage yeah. a lot yeah. of family members to get to know their legislators. Mm -hmm. um, the legislators have actually told us a couple of years ago that they don't hear from a lot of constituents that have a loved one in prison or ex-prisoners or, um, well, they hear from advocacy groups <laughs> quite a bit. But um, so, you know, I think it's really important for people out there that want to be involved to just, you know, go sit down and have a cup of coffee with their legislator mm -hmm. and, and tell them about their experiences. Mm -hmm. They don't know a lot of them. <laughs> Well, that's kind of where I stepped in. Melody is very astute politically and had been working on this bill. And uh, I have a background in being politically involved in supporting candidates. And it was surprising to me how many families of prisoners just didn't even know they could talk to their representative or were completely uh, novice at how to engage with the people that we elect and pay taxes towards and so Kinda it's like really like a rock star they were all <laughs> can we call this is that okay <laughs> and, I, and i usually will you know i deal in despair because when people have bumped up against the wall and lost their visits and they have nowhere to go and it, something you know medical care is being denied or their visits are gone you know they come to our family support meeting we meet in monroe on the second saturday of the month at the monroe library from 10 to noon before visits. And so if anybody's out there and you just wanna be around other people who have loved ones in prison, it's okay, have a cup of coffee. If you want help navigating the system or we've got a legislative bill we'd like you to help us with. It's really a great place for people who share a common experience to come together. And it's really hard. A lot of family members won't tell the people they work with or the people they go to church with or their neighbors that my son's in prison. They have a false sense of shame. I think I, so. You know, yeah. that's not, it's whatever your loved one has done is not your burden to carry. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. we do to a certain extent, but, um, you know, they, they don't need to feel that shame. It's not something that they've done. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they need to find their voice and realize that. Mm -hmm. And they're doing well because Melody, you know, she <laughs> has a great piece of legislation and you know, we'll put out the call to families that we've helped. I mean, when you when someone's in despair and you actually help them, they um, are empowered f for their own situation, and then they can see the true power of of helping each other. and And that's what the ombuds bill has done. More people have shown up at these hearings, and we find each other, and and they want to get involved. They come in with their particular issue but immediately can see that by helping each other with our individual issues, we can come together for the greater good. And really the Ombuds Bill is a greater good. It's a greater good for the families. It's a greater good for the Department of Corrections because they really need oversight. And there's a lot of good people in the Department of Corrections Absolutely. that are afraid to step up and say, this is wrong, it shouldn't happen. Because they, they, they sign, yeah, look who signs their checks. So, so. if there's somebody <laughs> outside coming in and saying, this needs to be fixed, they know it, they're not gonna say it. So it's good for the corrections, it's good for the citizens. I think it'll save us a lot of money on tort claims and legal action, which now are, the payouts are pretty high. So outside oversight is never a bad thing. It adds transparency and accountability 
to basically an institution that we set up and we fund. And we have a responsibility to make sure that that's done humanely and honestly. So that's why I'm so excited about the Ombuds Bill. We're going to yeah. run it again, yeah? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so we mm -hmm. have just under 10 minutes left. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you have an estimate of what it would cost? Because that's the reason Olympia always gives for rejecting something is the notice of cost. Bill? Yeah, how much that would cost so for an ombudsman. And then talk about mm -hmm. um, CI in general, because it sounds like they're bringing in a lot of money. Perhaps the funding can come from them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we have thought of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so what was the first question again? Oh, do you have an estimate of what the Oh, yes, so cost? thank you. Um, so it's kind of strange. Indiana has an ombuds program that's located within the governor's office. Their budget for one ombudsman and a full-time staffer is $125,000 a year. So um, here in Washington, I don't know how it happens, and I, I haven't been able to get a clear answer. But every time we say, okay, we want two ombudsmen and a full-time staffer, and we're going to do it for 250000 a year here in Washington. Um, next thing you know, we've got a fiscal note of, you know, one point some odd million dollars. And, and basically, it just continues to kill it because resources are pretty scarce right now. Um, and, you know, McCleary and everything else. Um, so... It can be done cheaply, it can be done, it can be huge. I mean, we have other ombuds office here in Washington. We have, uh, DSHS has a huge ombuds office. We have a, um, one for education, we have one for disabilities, mm -hmm. long-term care. Um, so, yes, the fiscal note does tend to kill it, but it can be done much cheaper than, than that mm -hmm. keeps showing up. Mm -hmm. And um, this year we thought we'd take that money issue off the table and so, um, part of the monies that we spend for the phone and the vending machine foods and stuff, there is a slight set aside and it goes back into what's called the offender betterment fund, which is used to like buy TVs for the day room. It's our money that they set aside to, to spend on, on offender uh, programs. And so we wanted to take the money off the table and see what was really going on. So <laughs> our last year we said, you know what? Forget it. We'll pay for it out of our own offender betterment fund. And it was interesting because then the objections stopped being about, well, we can't afford it and became more like, well, you know, why would we have it attached to the governor's office? So we were able to flush out some more challenges that we would have to address. And people who had actually supported it before that all of a sudden when it, it was actually had the potential to happen mm -hmm. all of a sudden weren't supportive of mm -hmm. it so mm -hmm. julie's right about the flushing out <laughs> mm -hmm. and that's good because if yeah. somebody is not supporting this legislation because they have a legitimate concern we just need to address that concern or adapt the legislation to make it amenable to them and so um, i don't think the money it's an easy th reason to say we can't because of the money but when the money is not an issue you get down to what exactly we're asking for and what exactly they're willing to provide. And, and I think those conversations are happening um, on that. Um, so you said get the money from Correctional Industries, <laughs> and boy, I would love that. <laughs> but um, Well, they, um, they are yeah. making, um, you know, millions of dollars off mm -hmm, of families, mm -hmm. and it would be nice. But, you know, th they'll say, well, this money's designated, just like the Offender Betterment Fund, they said that money's designated for this. If you take it away, then we won't have this program or be able to pay for that. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that it would be the same argument for correctional mm -hmm. industries. We're making a lot of money off families, but if we have to pay for this ombuds out of this division of DOC, then, mm -hmm. you know, what's going to suffer? Mm -hmm. So talk just five minutes now. Talk more about um, correctional industries itself. It sounds like it's a for-profit mm -hmm. business that was set up by mm -hmm. the Washington... No? Yeah, kind of. Okay, so um, you've all heard of like people go to prison and they're making license plates for the state, right? So um, Correctional Industries is actually the Department of Corrections. It's a division of them, but it's sort of been set aside and run on its own. And there are different kinds of jobs you can get from Correctional Industries called classes. So class one is when prison labor is used for at four profit companies, like leased out to AT&T to run their uh, call service lines. And that's not true, AT&T, I'm not calling you out. Or anything, <laughs> but, but, you know, having inmates work for for-profit businesses, that's no longer legal for the most part in Washington State because it's unfairly competing with Washington State businesses. And that there was lots of lawsuits, and so they really don't do that. Class two employment 
is um, the more formal correctional industries like the print shop, the upholstery shop. These are actual jobs supervised by correctional officers but managed and run by correctional industries. And those men make eh, around a dollar an hour maybe. And then you have oh, also lots of deductions, yeah, lots of dedu <laughs> well, all those deductions I described. Yeah. So then you have um, class three jobs, which are cleaning around the unit, um, working in the kitchen, just basically the nuts and bolts running of the prison. It would the place would come to a grinding halt if inmates did not do their class three jobs yeah. and they make 42 cents an hour. And that's capped at fifty five dollars a month. And then you get all the deductions. Right. So um, inmates will and work. And then you buy, and then the money that you make, <laughs> yeah. you uh, end up giving back to CI in the form of the company store. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so these different job categories have their different incomes and their different caps on that. And again, you're working, you get your 42 cents an hour capped at 55 a month, but 20% of that goes to cost of incarceration. So that's like a 20% kickback to your employer right off the bat. And mm -hmm. so you can see the money looks like it's going out, but if you follow the trail, it keeps going back to this division that um, uh, is somewhat of a mystery. It's a mystery. <laughs> and and um, Danielle would say, once a dollar comes to us, we never return it. It's just kept by correctional industries and reinvested into programs and new equipment and forklifts and refrigerators or whatever. And I think the Trucks Seattle Times did a great job exposing some of the not so efficient and wasteful and oftentimes unethical activities that they're involved with as far as employment. So we just today want to raise awareness, have some folks kind of get a glimpse into our reality as family members, yeah. uh, our reality as having front row seats to the prison system, and uh, hopefully asking anybody who's intrigued, informed uh, to get involved and like the Facebook page? You yeah, do we do. Pitch. We have yeah. a Facebook page. Uh -huh. It's uh, WAS Citizens for a DOC Ombuds. And we have an email address. It's WA, the number four, DOC Ombuds at yahoo.com. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot planned. Give that yes. email again because mm -hmm. I didn't you know, have time to write it down. <laughs> <laughs> it's WA, the number four, mm -hmm. DOC Ombuds at yahoo. Okay. And you um, had mentioned you've got legislation that's or a bill that you... We're you're working on it right now. Um, Disability Rights of Washington has been a big supporter of the Ombuds Bill, and le especially last year. And um, they actually do some Ombuds work. King County has an Ombuds that does a lot of work with the jail. There's a lot of people out there who support this. I mean, we're... We're pretty small compared to some of the larger groups out there. Some of the faith-based groups really support it. Um, it just, you know, it all depends what they're working on mm -hmm. as to how much effort they put into lobbying for it. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned earlier that you have monthly meetings, twice yes, monthly meetings? Yes, um, the Prison Support Network meets in Monroe at the Public Library uh, the second Saturday of every month from 10 until noon, and everybody gets out in time to get up to visit, so it's very convenient for families. And, you know, the meeting is whatever the people who show up need it to be. You know, if it's just to have coffee and chat, or if it's Melody coming and giving us a good, you know, pep talk <laughs> about the new legislation and how we all can help. We all work together. We are a family of, a community support of people other. that support each other in all of our endeavors, and we really just want to make, make things better. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately, a half hour isn't enough time to <laughs> get into more detail on this, but uh, yeah. perhaps you'll come back and give us <laughs> some more updates on what's going on there in the mm -hmm. prison That would system. be great. All right. Well, Thanks for having me. Yeah, unfortunately, we're out of time. I want to thank you both for coming in. Yeah.